Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm, we are literally going out the doors. I'm going to invite folks, just if you're in the back, if you want to come up, you can stand in the front. You're standing anyways, or go ahead and just sit in the front. But let's get everyone who wants to be in the room, uh, in the room. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Constitutional Studies Program and the Tocqueville Program. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, I want to thank especially ND Votes uh, for co-sponsoring uh, this event with us. Just a few uh, announcements. Um, uh, a number of you have asked. We have the, the Con Studies Program and the Tocqueville Program have an undergraduate fellows program. We call them our Tocqueville Fellows. Uh, the Tocqueville Fellows um, dine with our speakers. They help us plan events. They help uh, run, run the program, really. Uh, th this morning, they were supposed to uh, have breakfast with our speaker, who unfortunately spent the night in the Detroit airport. Um, so if you're interested uh, in joining the program, we have our application, our call for fellows. You can find that uh, on our website, uh, tocqueville.nd.edu. Uh, it's a competitive uh, application, not too difficult. Uh, but if you're interested, please, please apply. Uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, usually we have a student introduce our speaker, but we're going to have our eldest student uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, the, actually, the founding director of the Tocqueville program, uh, Professor Michael Zuckert, the Nancy Drew Professor of Political Science, uh, will introduce his uh, good friend from graduate school, uh, Dr. Bill Galston. Michael? Thank you, Philip. Um, I am here as announced to introduce William Galston. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, William Galston. I don't know. Yeah. Says it's on. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'll start again. I'm here to introduce our speaker tip this afternoon, William Galston, currently from the Brookings Institution, but from a whole string of other institutions uh, before that. Uh, and it's not a sign that he was not able to hold the job that he's been at many places. So I wanted to just assure you of that before we get into it. Bill Galson is in fact uh, most definitely one of our most talented students of and commentators on contemporary American politics, as is visible to those who have caught some of his columns, op-ed columns, in the Wall Street Journal recently. Um, he is also undoubtedly one of those political scientists who has made the most telling and important contributions to American political life, practical political life, as, was, as is witnessed by the fact that the American Political Science Association fairly recently gave him its prize, the Hubert Humphrey Award, which is given to political scientists who have done just what Bill has done. Among other things, he has served as advisor to and in one case, actually, as a policy position, uh, as a policymaker uh, for presidential candidates, uh, John Anderson, some in the room can remember back to him, I think. He was running in 1980 against Ronald Reagan, uh, not for the Democrats, but as an independent. Uh, he worked also for Walter Mondale, uh, who also ran against Ronald Reagan, both of whom had not great success, I'd say. but. Uh, and then finally for uh, Bill Clinton, who was a winner. And under Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Galston worked as a deputy assistant for policy, uh, domestic policy making, and that uh, guy's had quite an impact, in fact, on the government. Um, he is also definitely one of our most talented political theorists, as witnessed by the fact that he's written several very important books in this field including the publication of his doctoral dissertation called Kant and the Problem of History. Um, later on, he wrote a book called Liberal Purposes, a book called Virtues, and finally, uh, more recently, his book, I don't want to say finally, he's written other things, but I <laughs> picked that out. <laughs> uh, his a recent book <laughs> called Liberal Pluralism. Um, his talk this afternoon, which is titled The Future of Liberalism After Trump, is going, I think, to pull together many of the themes from his uh, scholarly and uh, non-scholarly pr practical work. Um, so will you please uh, join me in welcoming William Colston.
Well, let me say at the outset, <clears throat> uh, there, if you don't like this lecture, uh, there are two things or people or entities that you can blame. Uh, one is the guy who introduced me uh, because he was the one who suggested this topic and like a good student, once I get my, my examination question, I try to answer it. Uh, and second is Delta Airlines, which was definitely not ready when I was. <laughs> and so the, the reference to a night spent in the Detroit airport was not casual. There are lots of people in this room, I see, of an age appropriate to pull all-nighters. Uh, this old man is not one of them. Uh, and so if I stop making sense at some point, including right now, uh, the Delta management is where you should send your complaints. Uh, but to turn, to turn to my topic uh, of the future of liberalism under Trump, uh, this is, not to pull my punches, this is a really hard question. Uh, I would expect nothing less from Professor Zuckert, as his students know. Uh, and my answers to this question, and I use the plural, are necessarily going to be speculative. Uh, and I think after you hear what I have to say, you will agree with me that I'm offering pieces of an answer uh, in a somewhat speculative vein, uh, more loosely organized than one would expect from a final account of the matter. But I am trying to get my arms around a pretty unruly, untidy subject. I characterize this question, the future of liberalism under Trump, as a hard question. But there are a number of different ways of understanding the question, uh, some of which uh, lend themselves to much easier answers. So for example, suppose one understands liberalism in a very loose, uh, but I think not entirely inaccurate way, as the synonym for the concept of a free society. You know, a society with a familiar but valuable ensemble of political, civil, and economic rights and liberties. Uh, and I think we have learned in practice what a free society requires in order to endure over time. Not necessarily forever, but over a considerable period of power. I think we have, uh, of time, I think we have learned that the dispersion of power is a very important piece of the answer to that question. Uh, and, we have un and we've come to understand also the kinds of institutions that tend to the endurance uh, over time of a free society, such as a free press, an independent judiciary, general acknowledgement of the importance of the rule of law, a robust, diverse, and independent civil society. I could go on, but this is a familiar picture. And if I ask what is the future of liberalism understood in that very baggy sense, loose and baggy sense over time, I would say much like the past. Uh, unlike some of the pessimists, uh, I do not believe that the fundamental building blocks of our particular free society have been pulverized or displaced by recent events. Uh, I think our institutions have come under stress. If you will, it's been the political version of the famous stress test that former Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner uh, imposed on our big financial institutions. They passed that test with a little bit of help from their friends. Uh, so our institutions are undergoing a stress test. They have bent. They have not broken in my opinion, and I do not expect them to. So in that sense of liberalism, uh, as a synonym for a free society, 
I think the future will be much like the past, although I think we have learned something about the contemporary vulnerabilities of many of these institutions, and it would not surprise me to see measures taken in order to try to insulate them more against the kinds of attacks that we have learned they can be subjected to. Let me give you another you know, construal of liberalism, very different, which once again lends itself to an easy answer. That is liberalism in the 20th century sense as collective provision of valued goods, roughly speaking, the New Deal plus the Great Society, shorn of their less viable features. Uh, so, for example, major social insurance programs, such as Social Security and Medicare and unemployment insurance, or various programs of assistance to the needy, uh, including not only food and housing, but also health care. Here again, the future will look a lot like the past for the very simple reason that nothing has changed. Why has nothing changed? Well, because in this respect, before Trump, Trump, and after Trump, whenever after Trump begins, there are different views in this room, I'm sure, as to when it should begin, uh, there has been very little in the way of policy change. Why is that? Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, many of you remember candidate Trump's famous announcement speech uh, when he rode down the elevator and then delivered himself of some tarp remarks about immigrants, particularly Mexican immigrants. I think everybody remembers that particular litany, you know, capped by, and some I'm sure are good people. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure he was sure, but, <laughs> but that's a different point. Okay, you probably do not remember another important line from that speech where he says, we have to, uh, this, is, this is candidate Donald J. Trump on his very first day as a candidate, we have to save Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, period. Without cuts, period. We got to do it, period. Okay. That is not a statement, I think, that Paul Ryan would ever have made. Uh, and this alerts us to the fact that populism is very different from small government conservatism. In many respects, particularly the economic respects, populism does not challenge the fundamental building blocks of liberalism that were created in the 20th century. And I don't think it's any accident that in the first two years of this administration, there was no serious attempt to do anything to Social Security or Medicare. And I heard an account of an, inst of an interesting private conversation uh, that President Trump had with Speaker Ryan in which uh, Mr. Ryan brought up the subject, you know, and uh, the president said, according to this account, we can't do it. The people want their money. That was the end of that discussion. <laughs> now, you might argue, uh, you, you might argue that, uh, you know, that his support of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act did, would have made a difference for the Medicaid program, because the expansion of Medicaid is an important part of the Affordable Care, <coughs> Care Act. Uh, that was never the heart of the president's campaign. That was something he said because an important part of the coalition he was trying to appeal to was committed to it. I don't think he was particularly committed to it. Uh, and I know that he became troubled when senators from red states began calling up the White House and saying, you know, if this repeal pass, 
passes, you know, X hundred thousand people, my constituents are going to lose Medicaid coverage. He got that kind of call, for example, from Shelley Moore Capito, a uh, senator from West Virginia, the single biggest per capita beneficiary of the Affordable Care Act, and interestingly, the state that gave Donald J. Trump his biggest margin. So there were obviously, you know, so there, there's reason to, reason to believe that the president's heart was not even in rep repealing or trimming that part of the program. Uh, the president whom I served declared, interestingly but prematurely, uh, that the era of big government is over. I think we can now say with equal confidence that the era of small government is over. Uh, and that the failure to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, and the failure even to try to do anything to rein in Social Security and Medicare suggests that the social insurance slash welfare state that we now have is plus or minus a little bit the one that we're going to have for quite some time. Some of you may think that that is a bad outcome. Others of you may think that this is a good outcome. I'm happy to discuss that with you in the Q&A period. But suffice it to say, for now, that is simply an empirical statement slash prediction. So those are two easy answers to Professor Zuckert's hard question. So where does the, where does the hard in this hard question reside? Uh, now I reach the, port, the portion of my remarks that I've, I've labeled as uh, some, somewhat speculative. But let me begin from where we are right now. Uh, we are a divided country. I would say a badly divided country. Uh, I began to notice about 18 months ago that the phrase civil war with various modifiers was appearing more and more frequently in the press uh, and among political commentators generally. Uh, and you know, without, you know, without regard really to ideological positioning. And so one of the, you know, one of the, uh, the leading lights of Claremont conservatism or populism or Antonism, I no longer know what to call it exactly, uh, Charles Kessler used the phrase very recently, a cold civil war. Uh, I don't think it's that cold, uh, but, uh, you know, but there are lots of people along the spectrum uh, who have used that phrase. And I think it is a revealing phrase. It points to a reality and it points also to a deep worry about where we are and whither we are tending. Uh, what are we divided about? Well, there's some respects in which we've been, been divided for a long time. Uh, you know, for a very, for a very long time, uh, the Democratic Party has been the party of racial and ethnic minorities, you know, which have been expanding along with you know, a more than 50-year stream of, of immigration in the wake of the 1965 immigration reform bill. Uh, the Republican Party has not participated in that diversification. I'm putting it as gently as possible. Uh, we are divided by gender. One party is more appealing to women, the other to men. We are divided by age. One party is more appealing to the young, the other to the old. Uh, those are familiar divisions, though they're not getting better over time. Here are some new divisions on top of the old divisions. We are divided increasingly, at least white Americans are increasingly divided along lines of education. The more education you have, the more likely you are to incline to the Democratic Party. The less you have, the more likely you are to incline to the Republican Party if you are part of what I'm loosely calling white America. Interestingly, education has no impact whatsoever 
on sentiments in minority communities. That in the white community, education is about as close to political destiny as any other single marker. Another emerging difference, which is really broken out into open warfare, is about immigration and more generally demographic change. To summarize an enormous amount of research, uh, there are solid reasons to believe that immigration was the single most influential issue in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and by the way, in that regard, the United States is anything but an outlier. It, was, it had a huge impact on the Brexit vote that the United Kingdom is struggling with to this day. If Brexit had only been about the economic consequences of separation, the Remain campaign would have won. When it switched to issues of immigration and sovereignty, the vote flipped. Uh, and similarly throughout Europe, immigration has emerged as the single most explosive issue. I think it is responsible for the surge of populism in the past five years. If I have a lot of time to deliver a, a different lecture on European populism, I would go through every European country from Scandinavia to the tip of Italy, and I'd be able to tell you a version of the same story. Why is immigra immigration so explosive? Because as an issue, it is a symbolic trifecta. It encapsulates economic concerns, cultural secure, sec concerns, and security concerns, all wrapped up in one very intense debate. And finally, and this is, this is an issue that my colleagues and I have been working on at Brookings uh, now for some months, and we, we just came out with what I think is a major contribution on, on the subject. The split between metropolitan America on the one hand and small town and rural America on the other hand is now almost as wide as the split between white America and black America when it comes to voting patterns. Uh, and we are, now a we are now a nation divided by geography. But forget about this old trope of red states and blue states. That is much too crude a way of looking at the situation. We now have red regions and blue regions within states. And, so, and, and it has the same structure in every state. The less, less densely populated the region is, the more likely it is to vote Republican. The more densely populated it is, the more likely it is to vote Democratic. Here, again, we are not alone. That's what's so interesting about all of this, at least to me as a scholar. If you look throughout Western democracies, you will see that the small towns and the rural areas are the heart of the populist uprising, and the major metropolitan areas are the epicenter of resistance to this uprising. If you read this morning's Wall Street Journal, uh, you will have noticed that the revolt against President Macron of France is principally triggered by rural and small town discontent against the impact of economic, his economic policies on regions of France that are already struggling relative to the larger metropolitan areas. I could go on. So, to sum up this line of argument, in my judgment, we are now perilously close to becoming two Americas. An America of metropolitan areas and their suburbs, which is diverse, pro-immigration, pro-trade, relatively unreligious, relatively non-traditional on culture and gender issues, and temperamentally, viscerally internationalist in its outlook. The other America, the America of small towns and rural areas, demographically homogeneous, suspicious to say the least about the consequences of immigration and trade uh, for the way of life that they value, more religious, 
uh, with more traditional attitudes called, uh, towards culture and gender, and nationalist rather than internationalist in their outlook. These are the two Americas. And this is where I think the Civil War analogies or the pre-Civil War analogies suggest themselves. And it is why you are seeing, this is another very interesting development, more and more frequent invocations of the final paragraph of Lincoln's first inaugural address. Why is that? You know, we are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Why are we hearing that? Why are we hearing so many appeals to the better angels of our nature? It comes out of a deep fear, which was Lincoln's fear. Uh, that we are careening towards something that will be even worse than what we have seen so far. If you're with me, then the most urgent task we have is national reconciliation. That is the most urgent task for liberals, but not just for liberals. It's the most urgent task for everyone. And if I may steal with certain modifications uh, a line from a certain presidential candidate, I would say that in our current circumstances, intransigence in the defense of principle is no virtue, and moderation in the service of unity is no vice. What that means for me as a representative however flawed, of the liberal cause is an imperative that I feel personally and that many people like me feel to reach out to conservatives, including longtime you know, opponents, uh, in the name of finding as much common ground as is available. Uh, in that connection about a year and a half ago, uh, William Crystal and I got together to form a new nonprofit organization called the New Center. Uh, and the point of this is to try to find approaches, principled approaches to our nation's problems that could be embraced without sacrifice, uh, without, without sacrifice of core convictions by both by both the center left and the center right. We believe we're making some progress. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about that if you're, if you're interested. OK. In the name of what are we doing this? Uh, it is in the name of an understanding of liberalism that is poised somewhat uneasily between theory and practice. And you'll see what I mean when I, when I lay it out. When I'm talking about the form of liberalism that I hope that people along this broad spectrum that I just mentioned can be comfortable with, it would go something like this. Liberal government is, in principle, limited government. Liberal in the phrase liberal democracy is not an antonym to conservative democracy. It is the antonym of total democracy. It is the antonym of general will democracy. It is the antonym, well, it's the antonym of many things. I should stop there. Uh, and, uh, you know, and limited government, therefore, entails a commitment in principle to a zone of protected liberty. And the interesting question then is, what is in that zone? And, you know, and liberals of different stripes, and by liberals I mean philosophical and not political liberal, and, and, and you know, not ideological liberals, can fight about what's in that zone. That, that struggle is one of the defining struggles of liberal life. But it is the existence of the belief in the line between what government has the legitimate competence to do and what it does not have the legitimate competence to do that defines a liberal outlook as opposed to an illiberal outlook. 
Second, there is an idea of equality built into liberalism as I'm defining it. It is an equality of rights, if you will, an equality of dignity and respect. It is an equality of basic citizenship, uh, where basic, you know, where where basic uh, duties and privileges of citizenship, such as voting and jury duty and military service and, and, and other things, are open to all, which does not mean that everybody can pass through Marine Corps basic training. Uh, but it does, mean, it does mean that you are not excluded from it because you're a woman or because of your ethnicity or because of your religion, or because of your height, or anything else. Uh, liberalism, as I understand it, and this is my third point, involves the opportunity for all members of the liberal society to be full members of that society, full members of its economy, full members of its political system, uh, with a full opportunity Note that I did not say an equal opportunity, but a full opportunity to develop their lives and deploy their talents as they see fit. And if I can steal a line from John Rawls, and this is the only line I will steal from John Rawls, you know, perhaps disappointing Professor Weithman is also with us, but uh, so be it. You know, I do think that for some purposes it makes sense to think of a liberal society as a system of cooperation for mutual advantage. I do not think that is a crazy point of departure for understanding at least one aspect of liberal society. And what that tells me, a system of cooperation is not a system where some people contribute and others don't. Or it's not a system where everybody contributes but only some people are rewarded for their contribution. It is a system where, so far as possible, everybody contributes and everybody is rewarded. Equally, not necessarily. Commensurately, not necessarily. But no one is excluded from the system of reciprocity. Let me just put it that way. Okay. So in this construction of liberalism, a liberalism to which, to quote George Washington, I hope the wise and honest may repair. Uh, there are a number of things that liberalism is not. Here's my list of nots. It cannot offer full compensation for all inequalities. Uh, you, may, you, know, you may have a burning desire to grow up to be a concert pianist, but unless you're endowed with the natural talents to do to, that you can develop, uh, have fun playing for friends and family at home, but you will not be a concert pianist, no matter how many tens of thousands of dollars are spent you know, to, make you, to make you into one. Similarly, there is a, uh, you know, there is a natural lottery known as parents. Uh, parents do not choose their children, and also vice versa. And we are not equally or equally fortunately endowed with the kinds of parents who can maximize, uh, who can maximize our chances in life. A society that tries to eliminate all of the consequences of these background conditions is a society that will very quickly cease to be a liberal society. Because only a society of total control could even imagine trying to eliminate the influence of all those background conditions. That's another way of looking at why liberalism is a system of limited government. Similarly, liberalism as I understand it is not a far-reaching system of economic equalization. There are some people who are in favor of that. There may be some good reasons to be in favor of that, or at least we can argue about that. But that is not part of the liberal creed as I understand it. The liberal creed may involve something like a social minimum. There is nothing illiberal in my view about the minimum wage, but 
you know, it's, a, it's one thing to say that there ought to be a minimum wage, and I'm sure there's some people in the room who think there shouldn't be. We can talk about that. It's one thing there should be a minimum wage for all. It's a very different thing to say there should be the same wage for all. You know, the first proposition flows from a defensible conception of liberalism. The second <coughs> proposition, in my view, does not. Finally, and I want to underscore this because this is a source of great confusion, Liberalism and progressivism are not the same thing. Repeat, not the same thing. Progressivism at its heart involves a certain conception of history. History has a linear direction. That direction is up. The present is better than the past. The future will be better than the president. Than, than the president, right. Yeah. <laughs> Now there is a slip. <laughs> yeah. but, actually, but actually, I was thinking about a different president. And just to show how e even-handed I am, uh, the previous president of the United States used a locution that I publicly criticized more than once. He said that X, whether X was a country or a movement or a leader, was on the wrong side of history. Newsflash, history doesn't have a side. Right? Liberalism is a set of principles, institutions, practices, and programs that represent a good faith effort to build a good society. There is nothing inevitable about it. Uh, the, fact, the, the fact that global democracy grew during a certain period of time is no guarantee that it will not retreat in the next period. And indeed, we are in a period, regrettably, of democratic retreat. Uh, don't hold your breath waiting for the end of history because history has no end. So what does all of this mean in practice? Uh, well, I will, state, I will state my practical conclusions very briefly so that we can get to the question and answer period. We have until what, a quarter of two or something quarter. like that? Yeah, OK, great. Uh, what do we need to do? Uh, I think we need three things. We need some new policies to deal with the most urgent sources of the divisions that I began by talking about. We need institutional reform so that, uh, you know, so that our government can be an effective instrument, once again, of public purposes, which it has not been for quite some time. And finally, we need some alternative to full-throated internationalism on the one hand uh, and its antithesis of full-throated nationalism on the other. We need, I believe, a new patriotism which is much the same as the old patriotism, which we have lost sight of. Uh, let me very quickly sketch what I have in mind, and then we can dip into it as you're interested. Uh, we need a new set of policies for making growth inclusive, not only across classes and races and ethnicities, but also across geographical divides. Uh, one of the major complaints of small town and rural America is that work is becoming scarce. Good jobs are becoming even scarcer. Now that we've named that problem, and now that the democratic process makes it impossible for any of us to ignore that problem any longer, after a long period in which we did ignore it, many of us, because we weren't aware of it, or insufficiently aware of it, there are things that we can do about it. Uh, and this has, been, this has been the focus of a number of major books and reports in just the past few months. Past few months, on the center left, from my Brookings colleague, Isabel Sawhill. On the center right, from Mitt Romney's former policy director, Oren Cass. And most recently, in a report that will be made uh, you know, that, that will, will be made uh, public uh, the day after tomorrow, 
a new bipartisan report from Brookings and the American Enterprise Institute uh, on restoring opportunity for the working class, uh, work, skills, and community. At the same time, we need a new attention to regional economics. Uh, this is the subject of a major report uh, that a group of scholars, myself included, at the Brookings Institution came out with just last week. We need immigration reform, and I say that for a very simple reason. Not that it's the most important issue that we face, but because it's the issue that's most responsible for poisoning our politics and dividing our people. Uh, there is an honorable settlement of the immigration problem. Uh, as a contribution to that, Bill Crystal and I put this out a couple of weeks ago, the immigration debate, the poison infecting our politics. Uh, and we have a set of solutions in which the President of the United States would find something to like, and his adversaries would find something to like. Uh, and I'd be happy to walk you through it if you're interested. We can do it. There is a majority in this country for center-left, center-right immigration reform. The problem we've had is that our political system has not allowed for the expression of that. Which brings me to my second category of what we must do, institutional responses to government dysfunction. Some, colleague, some colleagues of mine at Brookings uh, and, L and at AEI uh, dubbed Congress the broken branch. And indeed, it is. Uh, and that is a problem. It's a problem for Congress, but not just for Congress. It's a, it's a problem because in our system, a non-functioning legislative branch invites the other branches to expand and to take on tasks for which they are poorly equipped, poorly equipped constitutionally, poorly, poorly equipped organizationally. Uh, if, if we are worried about an imperial presidency and an imperial judiciary, as I think we should be on both sides, we should be especially worried about the root cause of these dual imperialisms, namely a legislative branch that you know, has lost the capacity to legislate. A group of us have been working on congressional reforms that we believe will help uh, restore the capacity of Congress to legislate. Uh, those reforms, interestingly, are at the heart of the current struggle over the selection of the next Speaker of the House. Uh, I'd be happy to go into detail about what some of these reforms entail, but it's getting interesting. Uh, I believe that we also need to renew our attention to the virtues of federalism. Uh, yes, we are a divided country, but trying to get the entire country to do one thing in response to that division, in many respects, will make the division even worse. Right? We should be united in all things necessary, but diverse in all things possible. I believe St. Augustine said something like that once upon a time. Uh, and federalism is one of the wonderful safety valves for difference and disagreements in our system. It is time to go back to it with a renewed understanding of what it can offer to it a divided society and also with a renewed understanding of what we can learn as a country from what the states do one by one. Uh, you don't have to be Louis D. Brandeis to believe that throughout American history some of the best ideas for the country have come from below, from municipal reforms, from state level reforms, have not been top down. Well, let's spend 10 or 20 years taking the virtues and opportunities of federalism more seriously and see what we come up with. Uh, I would also recommend uh, what I think of as neo Madisonianism. Uh, we, should, we should go back 
thoughtfully, the spirit of inquiry and the spirit of willingness to learn, to James Madison's understanding of why we have this elaborate, and some people think ramshackle government structure. Uh, why is it that our system of government is so different in appearance, in reality, in function, uh, from the governments of most Western democracies? What do we, you know, what sorts of problems do we incur as the result of the Madisonian understanding of what is needed to sustain a free society? But also, what advantages do we gain uh, from the way in which the Madisonian constitutional system both enables and frustrates the kinds of bold actions uh, that are more characteristic of parliamentary democracies? So that's my second basket of suggestions, serious attention to institutional reforms, the kinds of reforms that will address the problems that are making our divisions worse, not better. Finally, we should not have to choose between untrammeled internationalism and an equally unregulated nationalism. We should not have to choose between closed borders and abolish ICE. We should not have to choose, uh, we, sh we should not have to choose uh, between global utilitarianism on the one hand and collective selfishness on the other. As, as I've argued for decades, self-preference, whether individual or collective, is reasonable up to a point. And a balanced view of human life and of national life, and if patriotism understands both the validity of self-preference and the limits of self-preference. So it's not crazy to say that if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. I agree with that. But then we have to ask the next, next question. What does it mean to have borders? Under what circumstances do borders, if I may put it this way, trump other considerations? And to, in what circumstances do the other considerations trump the integrity of borders? If you're a suffering human being, what kinds of claims do you have on people across national boundaries? I don't mean to say that that question answers itself. I do mean to say it's a real question that cannot be answered by saying, if you're on the other side of a boundary, you have no moral claims. You don't count, right? So you don't have to say, you, no, there is no moral law that says you have to give the same attention to other people's children as to your own children. But there is a moral law that says that you cannot simply ignore other people's children. Right? There's a zone of reasonable, limited, self-preference. We have to relearn where that zone is. We have to regain our balance as a people. You know, we cannot lurch from universalism to collective selfishness without stopping at a point of equipoise. There will be no rest for our country until we understand both the necessity of patriotism understood as a particular loyalty to a particular place, a particular kind of self-preference, and the limits of that self-preference. I will close with the following thought. Liberal patriotism is a patriotism of principle and a patriotism of history. It is not a patriotism of race. It is not a patriotism of ethnicity. It is not a patriotism of religion. You do not have to be a good Christian to be a good American. About a third of the country disagrees with me on that point. But I'm right. Or at least, <laughs> or at least I'm, you know, I am speaking as, a, as an authentic liberal when I say that. And, and people who disagree with me 
are speaking authentically, but if I'm right, which I think that I am, they are not speaking as authentic liberals, or if they are, not without a much deeper, uh, a, you know, deeper relationship between a particular religion and a particular political philosophy than anyone who makes that assertion has been offering, uh, at least not in my hearing. I think I've gone on long enough to at least give you a sense of what I'm thinking about, and why we now turn to the question and answer session. Very good. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes or so for questions. Uh, we have a tradition here in the program, which is we invite uh, uh, an, an undergraduate student to ask the first two or three questions. Uh, any undergraduates with a question? Well, please don't be shy. I'm a really nice guy. Okay, There's one. <laughs> Uh, hi, Professor. Um, I'm John Soper, senior studying political science. Um, my question is, um, I'm curious to know what you think of the divide, or how much do you think the divide in the country is because of a lack of civics education? That's a topic that has been discussed mm -hmm. widely. How much does it have to do with you that? Know, um, I spent about 10 years deeply immersed in the civic education movement, and one of the things that I've discovered is that each generation thinks that the next generation is woefully ignorant of the basics of American civic life. And each generation is right. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a famous article that appeared in the New York Times, the front page article in the New York Times, I believe in 1942. You know, the basic, the, the headline was something like, American high school students know nothing about civics. Well, you could have reprinted that article every five years from 1942 to yesterday, and you would have been right. Uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, I think that as Americans, we tend not to have a sort of a working propositional knowledge of, of our government. That knowledge is more in our bones and in our hearts. It's one reason why I'm an optimist about America, because despite the fact that lots of Americans can't name the three branches of government, and can't name one Supreme Court justice, can't even name one of the two senators of the state they come from, unless you come from Washington, D.C., which you have none of those to name. Uh, but uh, uh, so I used to believe that the problem was civic ignorance. I no longer believe that. You know, I think the problem. I think the problem lies elsewhere, and I earnestly recommend more civic education in grammar school, in middle school, and in high school, uh, because I think that people are generally better off as citizens, knowing more rather than less about the, pol the political system of the country that they're part of. But as a remedy for the sorts of ills that I was talking about at the beginning of my lecture, I think probably not. Regrettably. Uh, another question from an undergraduate. Hi, Professor. Uh, thanks for coming, by the way. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I know you would kind of not really touched on the uh, racism portion of what the future of liberalism would be. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my question is there's the new ideal or challenge to the liberal system, which is that they say that there is a systematic racism or structural racism. Um, and some could argue that that could be from like the very building blocks of the government uh, on the backs of you know slaves or colonialism. Um, so my question is, is there a fear for you that the um, ideology of, of racism that's just kind of out there in the ether could be damaging to and actually create more of a divided society? Um, yeah. Uh, it is a big problem. And it's not just the problem on one side, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, to put it as simply as possible, uh, you know, I believed from the moment that I first heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that that was the right place for America as a country to be. That was the right roadmap for the future. Nothing that I've heard in the ensuing 55 years has changed my mind about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so, you know, in order to overcome racism, 
we have to believe that we can get beyond race. Right? And there are people on the right who believe that we can't, and there are people on the left who believe that we can't, and I think they're both wrong. Uh, and so the, you know, the liberalism that I'm defending is a liberalism not that it says that we have gotten beyond race, not that it says that we have gotten beyond race, but that we can and we should. And, you know, and that a day may come when things, and should come, and I believe will come, when, when the things, the blinders that affect the way we see other people and other groups of people will fall like scales from our eyes and we'll be able to see clearly. I'm going to take the moderator's uh, prerogative and follow up on that. What does that mean? You're, you're an academic by trade. What does your answer to that question mean for, mean for academic politics? Does it mean uh, getting beyond race? Does it mean uh, getting rid of certain departments, certain courses <laughs> of study? I mean, how do we do that in academia? All right. Uh, I will delete the adjective fortunately and proceed with, the, with my first sentence. I've been out of academia for quite a while. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, I, uh, you know, and I can't speak to the particular problems uh, that academia now faces, at least not, not with the, the feel that I might have been able to 15 or, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and so, if you're asking me, am I, am I opposed in principle to departments that, you know, that focus their attention on, on the, the history, for example, of particular racial or ethnic groups in this country? No, I'm not. Right? There's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. You know, am, I, you know, am I opposed in principle to departments of gender studies? No, but ditto. You know, I have to say, and this was one of the, this was one of the hardest col columns that I've ever written. You know, it was somewhere in the Me Too slash Kavanaugh seam, uh, where it suddenly became apparent to me that something that I thought was exceptional and aberrant behavior was considerably more per pervasive than I had imagined. And I talked to my wife about this, and she sort of shook her head and said, you dummy, <laughs> didn't know this. And I said, I've been, too, I've been silent too long. I've got to write something about this. You know, but this can't be a mansplaining column. So I talked to every woman under the age of 30 in my office. I spent a whole day doing that and taking notes. And they all told me the same thing. And then I talked to one of my oldest, dearest friends, a woman, uh, someone with whom I've been co-authoring papers and Democratic Party screeds and platforms for 30 years. And she shook her head and said, in effect, you dummy. And then she proceeded to tell me stories. And I said, okay, uh, I'm a reasonably sentient member of my society. And there is this entire dimension of gender reality that I knew almost nothing about. I do not believe that I'm alone, <laughs> right? Uh, and so I think, you know, I, I think there's a process of eye-opening and social learning that needs to go on in society. Uh, Academia has a legitimate role to play in elucidating these concerns. Uh, but to end where I began, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And I don't want to cross swords with any particular department in any particular university, because I don't know enough to do that. Uh, but uh, OK, enough said. Well, let's open it up to anyone. Dominic, and wait for a microphone. That's for the recording. Yeah. Hi. So uh, throughout your lecture, I was thinking about um, the fact that the populist sentiment that has been rising in this country has never really had a healthy outlet through elected officials. Um, the elected officials we see in the legislatures, either in the states or federally, are all part of this elite that we are a part of in this room. Um, 
And then you have people like my grandparents who never graduated high school, and the closest they will ever get to participating in political life is voting if they choose to vote. And so when a candidate like Trump comes along or previous candidates who appeal to that silent majority in American politics, um, when they come along, they get a huge swell of this kind of sentiment. And it's, it's not moderated at all because they've never been able to participate in political life, really. And so my question is, what about campaign finance reform? Do you think that would help at all in terms of the, the division we see between these rural communities, people who are not part of this political elite, who don't have the education, who don't have the finances to really participate and make changes in their communities and nationally and all of us in this room and everyone else who does? I'm, you know, I'm going to give you a contrarian answer, which is a lot like my answer to the first question about civic education. I wish that campaign reform, campaign finance reform, you know, were, were the solution. Uh, I, f I fear it isn't. Uh, I might quarrel a little bit with the phrase silent majority. Uh, it wasn't, in 2016, it wasn't even a silent plurality, but it was well located. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, but setting, you know, but but setting that aside, let me agree with the underlying premise of your question. There are a lot of people who feel underrepresented and voiceless. And one of the most powerful things you can do in politics is giving voice to the voiceless. One of the most dangerous things you can do in politics is giving voice to the voiceless. Because if you say, I am your voice, which people have been known to say in very prominent places, uh, you can then you can then represent their views for your purposes. You can use your view their views for your purposes, uh, and that's why the line between populist representation on the one hand and a phenomenon that goes all the way back to classical Greece and before, namely demagoguery, is such a fine line. Uh, I would I would also say that. Effective political participation is not principally a question of money. And let me tell you stories from just the past two years. Because I've read a lot of articles like this. I was never politically involved before. But after the election of 2016, I decided I had to get involved. And so people who'd been politically inert started getting together with their friends and neighbors. Right? They started organizing themselves in a very local way. Some people who never thought of themselves as political activists suddenly became leaders. Some people who never thought of themselves as political candidates suddenly put themselves forward for office. Nobody came along and gave them a bunch of money to do that. They did it anyway. And in many cases, once they put themselves forward, the money followed because in our new system, you can raise tens of millions of dollars, a few dollars at a time. If I ask, what is the single biggest change in our political system where technology and politics have interacted to create a new reality? It is, it is social media. It's the ability to reach out to hundreds of thousands or millions of people at the same time and to have them reach back to you either with messages or money or both. Uh, I was in a presidential <laughs> campaign in 1984 the outcome of which was determined by the inability of a political candidate who won a smashing upset victory in the state of New Hampshire in the Democratic primary to capitalize on that victory. There was no internet. He couldn't raise money over, you know, by mail fast enough to take advantage of this victory. In the current technological circumstances, he would have upset the prohibitive favorite, become the nominee of the Democratic Party. I'm absolutely confident of that. So, so I, I think that for reasons I can understand, people exaggerate the impact of money in politics. Let me tell you when money matters. Money matters when there's a small handful of people who care very intensely about some provision of the tax code, and nobody else knows anything about that provision of the tax code. Under those circumstances, going to the members of the committee with jurisdiction you know, over the tax code 
and making your views clear to them and making clear that there will be a relationship between their view on that piece of the tax code and campaign contributions can be extremely effective. But when you're talking about broad-based public issues, uh, you know, literally billions of dollars have been spent to change Social Security. No impact. Why is that? Because that's not the kind of issue where money makes the difference. And similarly, you know, just to go back to what I said before and underscore it, uh, your grandparents, uh, for reasons that you know much better than I do, uh, have chosen not to be full participants in the political system. I'm not going to stand here and pronounce on what those reasons are. Uh, they may be good. They may be not so good. They may feel that they don't have agency. I can understand that. I think they're wrong. They don't have agency as two people. They're or four people, or how many however many grandparents you have. But as part of a demographic group, they do have agency. They demonstrated that agency uh, two years ago. And uh, Donald Trump was outspent two to one. Didn't matter. Two to one. He was outspent by $400 million. Even, even in 2016, that's a lot of money. Didn't matter. <laughs> And we have less than 10 minutes. We should get as many questions in as possible. And I see lots of hands. So let me go uh, to this side of the room. Uh, <coughs> use the microphone and tell us who you are as well. <coughs> so we'll try to go as fast as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Brennan. I'm a political science and theology major here. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned that it doesn't, you don't have to be a good Christian to be a good American citizen. Um, so then what is the role of religion, religious beliefs and practices in public life? Should religion form, inform uh, public life and political participation in any way? Or do uh, you really believe that liberalism, as Professor Janine has argued, uh, really makes us fundamentally religionless creatures? Or is there some space for uh, religion in public life that you see? Oh, so. absolutely. Ab absolutely. And, you know, I've become, you know, I've become unpopular among my fellow liberals, you know, for saying that what was once called the naked public square is something that is civically appropriate or constitutionally mandated. It's not. Uh, religious convictions can have, you know, a wide range of legitimate formative effects on the way we think about uh, our community, the way we think about public policy. And you know, I would be the last person in the world to rule those sorts of considerations out of bounds. The only point I'm making is that this not naked public square, but very porous public square, open to religion, open to philosophy, open to culture of all, of all kinds, cannot be understood homogeneously. Right? If Christianity is a legitimate uh, source of, of moral and human insight, uh, then so is Judaism. So is Buddhism. So are many other religions. Uh, now, we could have a very interesting discussion, particularly here at Notre Dame, about the particular peculiar relationship between Protestantism and, you know, and, and the United States. Uh, and I'm sure here at Notre Dame, you know, you know the history of Protestant doubts about the compatibility of Catholicism with American political institutions. Uh, and I'm sure you also know something about the century of history, you know, that, you know, that led to America's political acceptance of Catholicism, and I would say reciprocally to Catholicism's principled acceptance of America. You know, people like John Courtney Murray were very, very important actors in that reciprocal acceptance. Uh, so it is not my view that 
any form of religion is equally hospitable uh, to American political institutions. Uh, and uh, and we, there is a particular difficulty that we, we encounter when religion takes the form of public law. Because then you have a competing body of public law. That's a problem for Judaism, as Israel is discovering. It's a problem for Islam, as many countries have, have discovered. Uh, and uh, do, do all religions have a, a principle structurally similar to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? No. And that poses an interesting dilemma for liberalism. So is there a kind, is there a kind of <coughs> two kingdoms underpinning of liberal democracy? I think that's a really interesting question. I don't have time to answer it. Uh, but, uh, but you got me started. <laughs> well, yeah. one, one final question for you. As an uh, yep. advisor to the Clintons, yep. is Hillary going to run? <laughs> I find it almost inconceivable. Almost inconceivable. Okay, we'll take that as a maybe. Uh, <laughs> Professor Galston was too uh, modest to mention his excellent book. I spent the weekend reading it. It's called Anti-Pluralism. Uh, if you enjoyed the themes of this lecture, I highly recommend the book, and please thank, uh, join me in thanking Professor Galston. <laughs>